to the personality of God due to his existence above the three modes of material nature. They worshipped him to become free from material conditions and thus derive the ultimate benefit 
Whoever follows such great authorities is also eligible for liberation from the material world. And then we have the purport by Sugar Prabhupada. The purpose, the purpose of performing religion is neither to profit by material gain nor to get the simple knowledge of discerning matter from spirit. The ultimate aim of religious performances is to release oneself from material bondage and to regain the life of freedom in the transcendental world where the personality of Godhead is the supreme person. Laws of religion, therefore, are directly enacted by the personality of Godhead, and except for the Mahajans, except for the Mahajans, uh, or the, his authorized agents of the Lord, no one knows the purpose of religion. There are 12 particular agents of the Lord who know the purpose of religion, and all of them render transcendental service unto him. Persons who desire their own good may follow these Mahajans and thus attain the supreme benefit. Oma Jnana Timurandasya Jnana Chaksura Milita Jena Tasmai Shri Gurve Naha Shri Chaitanya Mano Vistam Stapitam Jena Bhutale Swayam Rupakadam Yam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeha Shri Guru Shri Gita Padakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamstra Shri Rupa Sa Rajatam Sahagana Rabinatam Vitamtam Sajayam Sahvaritam Sahvarutam Parijanam Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Deva Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishapani Pastra He Krishna Haranasindu Dina Vandu Chakadade Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namaste Tata Kanchana Gorande Radhe Vrindavadishwari Vrishavanu Sute Devi Parama Kitaripi Vancha Alpata Rupyascha Viva Sindhu Vahevacha Pajita Nam Pavane Yo Vaishnavi Yo Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasari Gaur Gautavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we just read a verse from the second chapter of the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam in the first chapter, we had the sages in Naimisharanya put a number of questions to Sutta Goswami. And now in the second chapter, Sutta Goswami is replying to the sages. He has explained to them, for example, what was the essence of all the scriptures? Because there are so many scriptures, there are so many books of Dharma, of religion, the Vedas themselves are so vast. How to understand what is the actual essence of all of this teaching? So Sutta Goswami actually gave the essence when he spoke one verse. He said that Savai Kutsam Paro Dharmo Yato Bhakti Adho Sajay Ahaitaki Apratiyata Yayama Suprasidati. Sutta Goswami is saying that the supreme occupation for all humanity to attain 
is loving service unto the Supreme Lord. Such service should be unmotivated and uninterrupted in order to completely satisfy the self. So two words are particularly important. Ahaitiki, apatinata. Describing the nature of pure devotional service. That it should be without material motivation. And Srila Prabhupada begins this purport also talking about what is the real purpose of religion. That the real purpose of religion is not for some material profit. It is not to just simply satisfy some material desires which we have. That has already been rejected in the very invocation of the Srimad Bhagavatam. When Srila Vyasadeva wrote, um, Dharma Prajta Kaitava to Paramon and Mansaranam But this Srimad Bhagavatam propounds the highest truth. It completely rejects all religion which is materially motivated. Material motivation in religion is what we call kaitavata or cheating religion. We make a show of religiosity, we make a show of devotion, but in the heart there is the desire to get something. I need this, I want this. God should give this to me. And we even think, I deserve it. <laughs> we want to dictate our desires to God. We want to tell him what we want. So this is not actual genuine religion, but it's very common all over the world today. It's very common, and not only today, of course, in the past also, because this is the Kali Yuga. In Kali Yuga, we're not very pious and we're not very religious. We're quite fallen. And we think religion is simply there to facilitate our material needs. We have to learn from Srimad Bhagavatam what is actual real religion. And Srila Prabhupada touches on it in the purport when he talks about the purpose of religion is to get us out of this material existence. That we are here in this world of birth and death and we should solve that problem. The real problem of life is that we have material body. And this body, of course, is temporary is going to finish one day and then we will take birth again. And where are we going to take the next birth? That will be determined by how we live in this life, the activities which we perform. Therefore, we have to be properly guided how to live in this life. What should we be doing with this life? And Srila Prabhupada explains to guide us, there are Mahajanas, there are authorities in the process of devotional service. They are 12 in number, and they have been described also in Srimad Bhagavatam, was spoken by Yamaraj himself, and he listed the names of our 12 authorities. Swayambhu, Narada Shambhu, Komar Kapilomanu, Pralado Janako Bishmo, Balir, Vayasaki, Vaya. So, Vaya, myself, meaning Yamaraj. Lord Yamaraj is speaking this verse, and he was describing to his own servants, the Yamadutas, who are actually the real authorities in the path of religion. We have to be guided 
by authorities. In this age, we don't like authorities. Western society brings us up to question authority. We will say, who are you to tell me what to do? And we talk like that. We're so arrogant. We're so bold. We don't like to hear from someone who may be our senior, who may be actually our authority, and we will question them. But the Krishna conscious process is based on accepting authority. Just like in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes if we want to learn the truth, how to approach a spiritual teacher. And this, of course, is a well known verse in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4, text number 34. Tatvidi pranipatena hari krishnena sevaya upadeshyanti kirtyana pranina Just like in Christianity, the Christians, they have famous verses from the Bible. You know, John 3.16, the book of John, chapter 3, number 16. No man cometh unto the Lord but by me. So Christians are very fond of quoting verses. So similarly, as devotees of Lord Krishna, we're very fond of quoting verses from the Bhagavad Gita. And Srila Prabhupada often quoted verses from not only Bhagavad Gita, but from Srimad Bhagavatam, from the Upanishads, from different Vedic references. And he would quote these verses to show the authority that there is this information there to guide us. We do not just simply blindly accept the words of the Guru. Although Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, try to learn the truth by approaching a spiritual teacher. Inquire from him submissively. Krishna says, pranipatena. First, the first thing you have to do when you approach the spiritual teacher is to fall down without reservation. We, <laughs> we're not accustomed to that. Most nowadays, you know, we, we think, fall down? What do you mean? <laughs> bow down? This is unusual. We don't like, people don't like to bow down. We have that kind of shantry of mood. You know, like Bhima, they told Bhima wanted to get some lotus flowers from a lake and the Gandharva said, you have to get permission to go there. He said, I'm a Kshatriya, I don't beg permission from anybody. <laughs> so we have that kind of mood, you know, that we, we're thinking we're Kshatriyas, we don't want to take authority. But if we want to learn spiritual knowledge, it's required. The first thing which is required is submission. We have to submit ourselves. We have to admit we need help. Just like in the Bhagavad Gita, we see Arjuna. Now Arjuna is a Kshatriya, but he comes on the battlefield and he sees Bhishma and Drona and he's bewildered. And he's thinking, how can I fight? These people are worthy of my worship. Arjuna becomes confused about his duty. But what does he do? Well, Arjuna was intelligent because he understood his problem. He, as he said, Kapanya dosho pahata svabhava. Yes, see, the devotees are well trained here, you see. They can quote the proper verse. This is the verse. Arjuna is saying, because of miserly weakness, miserly weakness. Are you miserly? Probably most of us are. Miserly in the sense that we have the human body 
and we don't use it for the real purpose. That is biggest lifestyle. One kind of miser, he has some money, he doesn't use it. He just likes to count it every day. You know, he likes to look at it. He likes to touch of it. He doesn't spend it. He doesn't keep it in the hand long, you know. <laughs> so, but the other miser, they have the human form of life and they don't use it for the service of Lord Krishna. That is a big waste. We've been given the gift of the human form of life and we don't use it for the real purpose to understand our true self and to get out of this world of birth and death. So Srila Prabhupada explains there is Kripana, the miser, and there is Brahmana. So who is Brahmana? In the Kali Yuga, Practically very rare that people are Brahmana. We hear Kalo Sutra Sambhava. In the Kali Yuga, everyone is a sutra or lower by birth. At least by our birth, we are in sutra or lower, but we can be elevated by the proper process of reformation which means to be guided by proper authorities. And who are the authorities? Prabhupada said, the Mahajans, the 12 Mahajans are there. In the purport of the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Srila Prabhupada is discussing this verse about the Mahajans because the point is, he said, you, the Mahabharat, quotes this verse and we should follow in the footsteps of the Mahajans. Mahajano Jena Gita Right? And in the Mahabharata, the verse begins, Tako Pratishta Shutayo Vibina Nasam Rishir Yashyam Nakam Vibina Dharmashya Tarpam Nehitam Gohayam Mahajano Yena Gita Sapanta. It's being described how to understand the, uh, the absolute truth. Tarka, by dry argument, arguments will be inconclusive. In Kali Yuga, we like to argue. Nobody will accept defeat, even though they're talking nonsense and they're defeating. They will never admit it. They will say no, no. Right? They, they will just keep arguing, although they're defeated so many times, so many times. They won't admit they're wrong. Very difficult for people to admit they're wrong. So Mahaparat says, Targo British strike argument are inconclusive. And Shrutayo Bibina, the Shruti. Shruti means the Vedas. The Vedas also speak many different things. Different points are explained. Somewhere in the Vedas it says Shiva is the Supreme. Somewhere it says Brahma is the Supreme. Somewhere it says Vishnu is Supreme. Somewhere it says there's all, everyone is God. There's so many different things said. How to understand what is actually there in the scriptures. So from, this, from the Vedas, it's also difficult to understand what is the absolute truth. And then the rishis, the great rishis, they will speculate and they will give their different opinions. We know there are different darshans. There's, you have, uh, you have uh, Karma Mimamsa from Jainini. You have uh, Patanjali Yoga Sutra. You have Gautama Logic. You have, uh, you have Veda Vyas, Vedanta, how, there are six different darshans. How to understand which one is correct? One will always defeat the other. They'll go on, you, and he establishes himself as greater, then someone else will defeat him, and then, then he will be, then the next person will be defeated. And in this way, you never come to any conclusion. But then, Srila Vyasadeva is written in Mahabharata, 
Dharmasya tetvam nihitam gohaya mahajano yena vijas. The absolute truth is hidden in the heart of the pure devotee. And one can understand it by following in the footsteps of these great souls. So great souls in the Kali Yuga, where were they? Kali, there's no great souls in the Kali Yuga. We could say, well, they're all from the past. All of these great souls, they're not here with us now to guide us. So Prabhupada writes in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, he talks about the modern day Mahajans. Of course, ordinary people, they all have their Mahajans, the people they're following, you know, some great cricket player or some politician or some Bollywood movie star. They're the Mahajans for the modern day people. So how to actually understand who are the Mahajans? Bhagavad Gita says, Yajan Acharyati Shrishta Tatan Ime Karojana. Common people follow the acts of great people. But who is great? You know, if you can swing the cricket bat, you're great. Or if you can uh, bowl <laughs> very well, you know, then you're a great personality. Or if you can, if you're a powerful politician and you get many people to support you, then you're a very great Mahajan. People are not properly educated to understand who to hear and who to follow. We want to guide them and show them that there's a need for people to follow the real Mahajan, the actual authorities. Srila Prabhupada mentions people like Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and the Goswamis, and then Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, and Baladeva Vijayabhusan, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, as well as Bhakti Vinod Thakur. These are the modern day Mahajans. These are great personalities who we need to follow, we need to hear about, and we need to glorify them. So, by the help of this Krishna consciousness movement, we are publishing many different books about these great people, and we are also holding different festivals to honor them. We celebrate, for example, their appearance or their disappearance. And we invite everyone to come and hear as we speak on the glories of these great Mahajan and their contributions to modern society. Unfortunately, People are not very well educated to take advantage of this kind of knowledge and of these great personalities. They may hear about that and they think, oh yeah, oh, very nice, but where is it for me? What's in it for me? We're thinking, how will I benefit? Well, the benefit is there that if you understand the message of these great souls, then if you will take up the, some of their instructions, it can free you from birth and death. The problem of life is not only economic. There are more problems to life than just simply worrying about our material body and our our bank balance and our job situation or my child's education. There are other problems. And the main problem is that we have this human body and our time in this body is limited. It is not infinite. We don't live forever. We have a fixed lifespan. And that time is running out every moment. We're using up our time in this world. 
and we will have to give up this body. Are we ready? Are you ready to give up this body? In the past, there was a great devotee in South India, Maharaj Kulushikar. Kulushikar is one of the Alwars, one of the great Alwars from the past. And the Alwars were also Mahajans. So Kulushikar, he composed a beautiful verse, which is very well known in South India. He prays that, let me die now. Well, I can still chant the holy name. Because if I wait for death to come, then my throat will be choked up with mucus and I will not be able to feelingly chant the holy name. So his expression, his desire to die now, this is a very interesting proposal. And he certainly clearly understands the purpose of life, that we want to chant the holy name at the end of life. That will help us a great deal. But if we have not practiced chanting the holy name of the Lord in our life, then at the end of life, it won't be possible to just suddenly chant. Sometimes people hear the story of Ajamila and how Ajamila was saved from the Yamadutas because he chanted the name of Narayan. So sometimes people think, oh, at the time of death, I will also chant the name of God. Why do I need to chant now? Let me wait till I'm dying and I will chant. But we should understand if we have not practiced chanting the name of the Lord throughout our life, then at the end of life, it won't be possible to chant either. We have to practice. Krishna consciousness is also a practice. It's a process, a scientific process. If you practice it, then certainly you will get the result. We have to practice faithfully. And then it requires teacher, just like the Mahajans. They are there to guide us, to teach us. We say actually there are three authorities. There is Sadhu, Shastra, and Guru. So Sadhu means the Mahajans, these great souls, the great spiritual teachers. They are all sadhus. Scriptures, the Shastra, like Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, and then Guru, spiritual teacher. Spiritual teacher may give instruction, may not be initiated, but some instruction should be there. You have to be we have to be guided. And then there should be no contradiction between the three different authorities. Whatever the Guru says, that should be confirmed by Shastra and also by Sadhu. All three parties should agree with each other. Not that one party says one thing and the other two parties say something else. There has to be complete agreement between the different parties. And generally, if you're fortunate, you will find there is agreement between the sadhus and the shastra and the guru. If you have the bona fide teacher, if you're reading the proper scriptures, and if you're guided by the authorized sadhus, you will see. They are all saying the same thing. Just like in Bhagavad Gita, we hear Arjuna say to Krishna, after Krishna spoke the Chatur Sloki of the Bhagavad Gita, then Arjuna was greatly impressed. And he said to Lord Krishna, he said, you are the Supreme Brahman, the Supreme Abode. He said, formerly, Asita, Devala, Vyasa, and Narada, they all declared this about you. 
And Arjuna said, now I can also understand it myself. So Arjuna was seeing the opinion of the sadhus, Asita, Devala, Vyasa, Narada, they all said Krishna is the supreme. Arjuna also agreed. Although Arjuna was thinking initially that Krishna was his friend and that even that sometimes Arjuna would joke with Krishna and sometimes say things which were not very nice. Just like uh, he would say to Krishna, oh, your father, he's not really a Kshatriya because Krishna was the son of Vyasa, Vasudev. Vasudev was Krishna's father, but Vasudev was not a Maharati like Arjuna. Arjuna was a great Maharati, a great warrior, but Vasudev, Krishna's father, he was more of a politician. He, was, he could speak, but he was not a military man to go out and fight. So sometimes Arjuna would joke with Krishna about things. And he would joke with Krishna that, oh, you don't even have a kingdom. You know, what kind of Kshatriya are you? You have no kingdom. He said, anyway, you can be my I'll be kind to you. I will accept you as my friend. Even though you don't have any status or real position, you can be a friend. So Arjuna was speaking to Krishna sometimes like this, but then he understood Krishna is actually God. And then he greatly regretted that he'd spoken in this way. He felt very sorry that he had ridiculed Krishna. Actually, Arjuna and Krishna are always friends and they're always together. Wherever Lord Krishna goes, Arjuna will go with him. Right now, they're in some other universe. Lord Krishna is speaking the Bhagavad Gita and Arjuna is with him. So this was all Leela. This is all the pastimes between the, the Lord and his devotees. Lord Krishna comes to this world to enjoy these different dealings with his devotees. Just like when he speaks the Bhagavad Gita, he doesn't speak it to just anyone. He doesn't pick someone like Kamsa and try to speak Bhagavad Gita to him. He chose Arjuna because Arjuna is a devotee and he's also a friend of Krishna. And at the very beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, you can see the difference between Arjuna and Dhritarashtra. In the very first verse of the Bhagavad Gita, you have Dhritarashtra showing his nature, right? He says, Mamaka Pandavas Chaipa. In the very beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, Dhritarashtra saying, what did my sons and the sons of Pandu do, being desirous to fight? So Dhritarashtra showed his mentality. He's not thinking the Pandavas are also my sons. Actually, Dhritarashtra was meant to be the guardian of the Pandavas. Because the Pandu, Maharaj Pandu, the father of the Pandu, Pandavas, he had left the world. So Dhritarashtra, as the brother of Pandu, he was meant to take care of the children of Maharaj Pandu. But he makes distinction. He said, what did my sons and the sons of Pandu do? This mentality, this is very bad. We're thinking about my children, someone else's children. You see, we're making a decision. I and mine. This is what is mine and what is not mine. Oh, I don't care about what's not mine. I don't care about mine. I'm only interested in what is mine. This is the selfish mentality. 
So that kind of person will have a little difficulty to understand the Bhagavad Gita. That's why Krishna didn't speak the Bhagavad Gita to him. But Krishna spoke to Arjuna because Arjuna, he's concerned about others. He's not just thinking about himself. He's thinking about others. Even he sees people on the other side, Bhishma, Drona, all the gurus, they've all come there to fight. And Arjuna is concerned. How can I fight these people? How will I enjoy if I have to fight all of these people, my relatives, my teachers, my relations, my friends, they're near, dear to me. I have to fight and kill them. This is the mood of Arjuna. Not that he's a coward, but he's concerned about others. He is not a selfish person, but rather he's inquisitive and he's thinking, how can we come to some proper arrangement to help everyone? So Krishna selects Arjuna because Arjuna is inquiring, why is it like this? Why is it? What's the problem? What, if, what has gone wrong that it's like this? We are one family and we're fighting with each other. Of course, in Kali Yuga, it's common. Families fight with each other. They will argue about even a a small, a few rupees, a few rupees is not a big fight between family members. This is Kali Yuga, the age of quarrel, the age of argument. And we are caught up in this Kali Yuga. We want to get out of this Kali Yuga. If you have to, if we have to remain in this Kali Yuga, it will become much worse. It's already very bad and it's going to get much worse. So the Vedas encourage us not to remain in this world, but to get out of this world, to finish our business. Srila Prabhupada used to talk in this way. He said, we should finish up our business. Business means you give the goods, you want something in return. But Prabhupada said, Krishna consciousness is not business. We finish the business. We don't want anything in return. We simply want to give. And we want to give what people need most, which is consciousness of God, Krishna, to understand who I am and why I am here in this world. We want to question these kind of things. This is the proper use of human life. And if we don't use the life in this way, we are condemned, my civil people. Of course, to be labeled a mind, it's not very pleasant. It's not very nice to have to be labeled as a miser. So don't be miserly. Be Ramana, be broad hearted, be generous, and become Krishna conscious. We want to give. Srila Prabhupada went to the West and said, I have come to give. So many other men went to the West and they were just simply coming to get money, to come back to India to live nice. We see today so many people go to the West, they go to make money and they will come back to India, buy a nice house and live comfortably. Prabhupada did not go to America to do that. Prabhupada said, I have come to give, to give what you have got what you have forgotten. And Prabhupada gave them Krishna consciousness. So this is needed all over the world. And we can see also here today in India, 
that there's a great need for God consciousness. There's a need for morality, for good qualities, for people to cultivate proper character. People have forgotten what is actually religion. In the Vedic scriptures, religion is described to be represented in the form of the bull. A bull stands on four legs, and the four legs represent the four pillars of religion. Satyam, Sojam, Daya, Tapa. Satyam, truthfulness. Kali Yuga, a lot of cheating goes on, a lot of lying propaganda. It's very common. So, Satyam, truthfulness, Sojam, cleanliness. Cleanliness, not only externally, not only bathing, but also internally, cleaning the heart, cleaning the mind. That is also required. Daya means mercy. Mercy is destroyed by killing of the animals, not only animals, but also fish and other different forms of life. Of course, you could say, well, you're vegetarian, you're also killing plants, isn't it? But we argue that plants are different from animals, just as people are different from plants. From, people are different from animals. We don't need people, I hope. Some places they do. So they eat, and we don't eat people because people are different from animals. And the same way animals are different from plants. The plants have a different consciousness than the animals. The animals experience pain. The plants, the plants don't experience pain like the animals. Plants are the prescribed food for human beings. They can be offered to the Lord. They are acceptable in offerings. But if you offer meat or fish or eggs, that cannot be accepted by the Lord. The Lord is a vegetarian. And all the Mahajans, they're also vegetarians. So we cannot say that, oh, it's all right, we can eat animals, they're there. Sometimes people tell us animals are there for us to eat. They do not understand. Yes, there may be a class of people who eat animals, but people who are concerned to cultivate higher intelligence, they will be more careful about what they actually eat and what is the proper food. And similar, uh, then the final quality, tapa. Tapa meaning austerity. Now, austerity, understand there's different kinds of austerity. There's austerity in goodness, austerity in passion, and austerity in ignorance. Sometimes people do things like torture the body. That is austerity in ignorance. But there is austerity in goodness also, which purifies. So austerity in goodness means to give up pride. Pride destroys austerity. I can understand you're all austere people because you're sitting on the floor. You see, people who are proud, they won't want to sit there. Sometimes they of course, some people, elderly people, are not able to sit on the floor, so they sit in chairs, that's all right. But, you know, some people, they will, they, will, they will say, why I should sit on the floor, you know, why I should bow down, they come to the temple, why I should bow down. They don't like the idea to accept someone as authority or to give respect to others. They don't like to bow down to God. In other words, they have a little pride or ego 
which doesn't allow them to respect others. So when Srila Prabhupada was discussing this with one man, one young American man, the American man was saying, why I should bow down? So Srila Prabhupada said to him that you don't have to bow down to Krishna, but you will have to bow down to old age, you will have to bow down to disease, and you'll have to bow down to death. Now, do you like bowing down to old age, disease, and death? You don't like it, but you are forced to do that. But our devotees, they're bowing down to Krishna. And because they're bowing down to Krishna, they will no more see old age, disease, and death. That is the benefit of bowing down to Krishna. It means no more birth and death. So this is tapa, austerity. Austerity. Austerity is destroyed by intoxication. Intoxicants are common. Things like cigarettes, alcohol, as well as uh, tea and coffee. Tea and coffee also intoxicants. They have some caffeine in them and they influence our brain. Even things like onion and garlic are not good because they have, they influence our thinking and our reactions. They're not proper food for people, although it's become very common. We know people in South India are very fond of onions, right? <laughs> I hardly you can find a vegetarian restaurant where there's no onion in garlic everywhere. But actually, these foods are aphrodisiacs. Aphrodisiac meaning they stimulate the passion in the body. There's even some airlines, they will not allow their pilots to fly if they've eaten garlic because garlic is a, such a strong substance, it influences their reactions and they cannot properly react to a situation. So the pilots are not allowed to eat garlic before flying. As devotees, we are conscious not to eat these things like they see garlic grew out of the dead cow, not a very pleasant origin of Buddhism. So we're conscious about these things. You are what you eat. We want to eat food which is in the mode of goodness. Food in the mode of goodness will increase the duration of life. They give health, nourishment, and satisfaction. Sometimes people think, oh, to be a vegetarian means you have to starve. It means you, oh, it's great austerity, you cannot eat nice food, you won't get, but there's so many wonderful dishes which we can have as vegetarians. Rather, we feel sorry for the people who eat non-vegetarian food. Sometimes you have to, you see what they eat, it looks like a, a graveyard or something. <laughs> Parts of the body, different bones and things. And people, you think, are you going to eat this? <laughs> it's so shocking. So, devotees, we follow authority, authority which leads us to a better life. And Srila Prabhupada used to remark like that, particularly when he was departing from the world. He said, if I have done anything, I have given a better life for so many people. So I certainly have to feel like that. Coming from the UK, I feel that the Krishna consciousness movement certainly has given me a better life. The, not, not knowing how people in England live and eat, I feel I gained a lot 
by coming to the Krishna consciousness. Srila Prabhupada definitely gave us something which is very valuable, a great treasure. He allows us not only a, a, a better way to live, but he gives us this knowledge, which is also very important. He helps us to understand the nature of this world. And he shows us also how to get out of this world. We shouldn't be comfortable in this world. Prabhupada would say only two people are happy in this world. One is the fool and the other is the self-realized soul. So one who is actually self-realized is happy because he knows he's not the body. And he understands his position in relation to the Supreme. He dedicates his life in that way. So we want to come to that level. We don't want to remain in darkness. As the Vedas say, Tamasima Jyotirgama. Don't remain in the dark. Come to the light. We studied the Greek philosopher, Plato. And in Plato's Republic, he talks about Persian, the cave dweller. The cave dweller, you know, he's in the bottom of a cave, prisoner with so many other people. But somehow this one man manages to get free. When they were in the bottom of the cave, it was very dark. There was only a little glimmer of a candle, flickering candle there. That was the only light in the cave. So somehow this one man managed to get free from the bottom of the cave and he came up to the surface and he came out into the daylight. It was the middle of the day and the sun was high in the sky, was very bright. And he saw the sunlight and it blinded him because he'd been in darkness for a long time. He'd been held a prisoner, a captive in the bottom of this dark cave. And then all of a sudden he comes out into the light and he saw the sun and it was very painful to him. So he went back into the cave he went all the way back down into the bottom of the cave and he told all the people, don't ever go out there. <laughs> Very terrible. There's this ball in the sky, it burns your eyes. So this is conditioned life. It's conditioned life is like that. The blind follow the blind. People don't think anymore for themselves. What is the real purpose of life? Where are we going? Who is guiding us? We're guided by people who are not at all qualified. We don't follow the Mahajans. We follow we don't follow Mahatmas, we follow the Duratmas. <laughs> We're following all these people with the bad habits, you know? All of these big names and television and sports and politics. We're following them. They're all crooked souls. We want to take shelter of the Mahatmas, the great souls. They can lead us out of the miseries of material life. So please, we encourage all of you Follow this process of Krishna consciousness, chant Hare Krishna, and make your life successful. Thank you very much, Hare Krishna. Are there any questions? Yes, Prabhu. So, Shiva Loka Vasis, they are bound to take birth and death, like uh, a Brahma Loka. 
or uh, so it is considered that uh, uh, it's all material uh, um, material uh, uh, world of the Brahma Loka. Uh, is, is this uh, Shiva Loka also material world or uh, spiritual world? Shiva Loka is between the material and spiritual world. Shiva Loka is in between. It's not actually in the spiritual world, and neither is it in the material world. It's between. It's like the, the marginal region. You see? This is the position of Lord Shiva's abode, Kailash, that is between the material world and the spiritual world. So people who want to follow Lord Shiva, generally, of course, today, the followers of Lord Shiva, they're atheists. There was a curse, it's described in Srimad Bhagavatam. At the time of the Daksha Yagna, there was cursing between the followers of Lord Shiva and the followers of Daksha. And so the, the followers of Daksha, they cursed the followers of Lord Shiva that they would all become atheists. And the followers of Lord Shiva, they cursed the people who follow Daksha, all the Brahmanas, that they would be practitioners of dull rituals with no meaning. And Srila Prabhupada said, both curses are in effect today. Generally, the followers of Shiva are atheistic. I had experienced myself. I was distributing literature one day over in Europe. And a young man I met, he's, I offered him the book. He said, Krishna? He said, I know Krishna can't be God. He has a mother and father. But then he said to me, Shiva is God. Shiva is light. This was his idea. Shiva is light. So, you know, Shivite people, they have these kind of ideas that God is light. It's difficult for them to understand that God is a person. So, where is the abode of Lord Shiva? It's between. Something like Buddhism also. The Buddhists also go to Shiva Loka, you know. They also often end up there. Because the Buddhists don't believe in God. They simply believe the world is suffering and they want to get out of the world of suffering. So where do they go? They, they may end up, if they're very pure, they may end up in the abode of Lord Shiva, which is between the material world and the spiritual world. Will, uh, will those Shivaloka residents will come back on earth? Again, they will take birth or uh, they will uh, simply, they will go to Vaikuntha Loka. Well, they can remain there with Lord Shiva in his abode. They can remain there in Kailash with him, and associate with him. But to go into Vaikuntha, that's not so easy thing because they don't have the devotion. They have no devotion for the Lord, so they cannot enter into Vaikuntha. They may enter into Brahma Jyoti, into the position of the Brahman, the Brahma Jyoti, go there, but not actually into the planets, not into the planet. Mm -hmm. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, yes, Just wait and take the ring. That is pronounced. Uh, you spoke about Guru Sadhu Shastra, uh, but uh, later we are supposed to surrender our intelligence to Guru. So, continuously checking Guru Sadhu Shastra is slow, might take a lot of time. So, but Guru will not be there physically with us. Uh, 
for a long time. So how do we uh, come to the stage of surrendering our intelligence to Guru a bit faster? Because we can, because checking Guru Sadhu Shastra is slow. So it takes a lot of time. Well, uh, you, you have to hear from the Guru. You have to hear. And Srila Prabhupada mentioned, he said, we should hear for one year in such a way that we, we are convinced that this person can help me. Of course, Guru, you have to understand what is qualification of Guru, how to recognize Guru. He is one who speaks according to Shastra. So if you don't know Shastra, then you might have difficulty to recognize who is the guru. It's not just a sentimental feeling that, oh, I like this person. Oh, he smiled at me. Oh, he's nice. I like his eyes or something like this. No. You have to hear. You have to hear it from the guru. You have to be convinced that this person can help. So you have to know what is that help. You have to know what is qualification of the guru, that he knows the Shastra, he speaks the Shastra, and he follows the Shastra. Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna also describes the qualification of the guru. He says, uh, that first of all, the qualification of the disciple is pranipatena paripashtena sevaya, and then upadeshanti tegyana, Jnani nas tattvadarshana. Then he's a tattvadarshi. He knows the truth. Not only does he know the truth, but he can reveal it to you. So some people may say, I know the truth. I just can't tell you. I just can't reveal it to you. I can't describe it. Now, if they can't describe it, it's not going to help you very much. So not only do they have to know the truth, but they have to be able to give it to you and present it to you in a manner in which you can understand it and accept it. So this is the, the, the principle. Hare Krishna. Yeah, any other questions there? Hare Krishna. I have one question. Uh, I heard in uh, scriptures, whoever wants to attend Goloka, or he has to come to honor and directly go to Goloka, or is it applicable for Brahma also? Is it applicable for Brahma to go to Goloka? Well, Brahma can go to Goloka if, first of all, he can only go at the end of his life, at the end of the life of Brahma. He has to wait for the end of his life because he has a responsibility. He's, you know, at the top of the universe and he's overseeing the affairs in the universe. So he can't just go away and leave everything and go back to Godhead. So he has to wait for the end of the life of Brahma. And you know, Brahma has a long life, right? You know about the life of Brahma. Sahasra Yuga Pariyantam Aharyat Brahmanovidu. That one day, Brahma, it's 1,000 ages, 1,000 Divya Yugas, the four cycles, the four ages together is one Divya Yuga, and 1,000 Divya Yugas is one day of Brahma. And then there's one night, which is the same duration of the day. And then that's only one day. And there's 30 days in the month and 12 months in the year. And Brahma lives for 100 years. So just imagine the duration of Lord Brahma's life. It's a long time. Yeah. But before he can go back to Goloka, he has to wait for the end of his life. And he also has to be in that mood of a resident of Vrindavan. Right? Now, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, it's described that Lord Brahma shook hands with the Lord. Lord Lord Krishna came and shook hands with him. And Prabhupada said, this shows that Brahma is in Sakyaras. Friendship. Because they shook hands with each other. 
So maybe we could say Brahma is a cow going to, if it goes to Goloka, it would be a cow or yeah. Like, if he go, but he has to be in that mode of bread, friend, Vrindavan. Not everybody is in the mood of the residence of Vrindavan. Now, other people are more inclined to Vaikuntha. And in Vaikuntha, there are different regions. You have Dwarka, you have Ayodhya, you have Mathura, as well as all the other different Vaikuntha planets. So, Brahma can go, but he has to be, he has to be really in that mood of the people of Vrindavan. Has to want to go to Braja. If he doesn't like cows, <laughs> and if he doesn't like being in the village, the village life, and going to the forest, so he won't like Goloka because in Goloka it's very rural life. It's not like my country. In Goloka, the mood is Madhurya, more sweetness. But by Kuntha, the mood is Aishwarya. So it's a question of what, what is your attraction? Are you attracted to the sweet? You want to be in a sweet relationship with Krishna? Or do you want the opulent Krishna? You want to see Krishna sitting on the big throne as Dwarkadish with all the people at his feet? So different moods will be there. Mm -hmm. Okay, Prabhu, your question. Hi, Dishman. Thank you for such a nice class. Um, you were just speaking on following the Mahajanas. So certain times, so some Mahajanas uh, activities, uh, we cannot specifically I was speaking about Bhishma Dev. So Bhishma Dev is uh, some activity like He's not supporting Draupadi or uh, at the time of his body, or even for that matter, giving more importance to his vow over Krishna Pansi at times. He's a little bewildered if, if Maharaj could kindly enlighten. Well, we could say that Grandfather Bhishma is there as a Mahajan on account of his uh, speaking. Mahar, he spoke for many, many days to Maharaj Yudhisthira. And that's why he says the Mahajan. It's, yeah, you could say, oh, he should have done something. He should have protected Drohadi. But after that, he spoke to Maharaj Yudhisthira and he pacified the mind of Maharaj Yudhisthira and he gave him instructions in how he should rule and how he should govern everything. So on that basis that he gave so much instruction about religion and how to uh, rule the kingdom, that's why he's a Mahaja. It wasn't what he did before, it's what he did after, right? So, you know, he, maybe he didn't do very good there that he stood and watched Tropadi being disrobed, but he made up for it at the end. He spoke so much wisdom, he gave so much knowledge, and so many great personalities, they all came to witness him departing from the world. So that's why he's Mahajan. Yeah. Question online also. One question online from you and me, Sachi Mataji. As high as Guru Maharaj, please accept my own obeisances of grace to Sri Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada says in his purpose, by serving the servants of the Lord, one gradually gets the quality of such servants. How can we acquire the qualities of such servants of the Lord? Well, you just answered the question yourself. <laughs> by serving the servants of the Lord, you will acquire the qualities. She answered the question herself. I don't understand. She's okay. Yes, Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you for a very nice class. Uh, my question is in general uh, concept. Uh, on one hand, in uh, Bhagavad Gita, we see the verse 2.40, 
नेहा विक्रमण Yes, well, he never lost his bounty, even in the body of a deer. Whatever bounty he had, it was still there with him. So, although he was in the body of a deer, he would go where the sadhus were in the Himalayas, and he would eat their remnants. And he just had to wait to give up the deer body. And as soon as he gave up the deer body, then the next life again. He was born in the Brahmana family, and then he was very careful. So his bhakti is never lost, and we see that also with Chitraketu. Chitraketu was cursed by Mother Parvati, and he became Vritasur, became a demon. But he never lost his bhakti, even in the body of a demon. So even though one may be cursed and put into different horrible bodies, like but still. The devotion, whatever progress we've made, we keep that with us and we go on in the next life from that point. So whatever progress we're making today, you'll keep that with you. It's there in your spiritual bank account. You know, the material bank account goes down, but the spiritual bank account only goes up. It never reduces. Dandavar Pranam Maharaj. Uh, my question is with regards to bhakti. Uh, is it bhakti means uh, that we acquire something from the outer side? Or is it that bhakti is already there? It is just the process of cleansing through which uh, we are able to reach to the higher understanding. Yes, it's a good question. Actually, both there. One, the Shastras say that love of Krishna is in everyone's heart and it is awakened by hearing. So we could say that the bhakti is there within us, but at the same time, we get the bhakti from the devotee, from the bhakta, the one who's got bhakti, he gives it to us. And this was described by Haranyakashipu asked Prahlad, where did you get your bhakti from? And then you have also Maharaj Rahugan asking Jadbarat, where did you get all this knowledge from? How did you get it? So both of them, both they both reply in a similar manner that you, the only way you get bhakti is you have to take the dust from the feet of the great devotees. And we have to take it all over our body. So the mercy from the pure devotees, that is very powerful. That is something very important. At the same time, we have some devotion within us. But without the blessings of the pure devotees, then it's very difficult. It's very difficult just simply on our own. We need to get the blessing from the devotee, and that opens the door. We say, Mahat Sevam Dwaram Mahur Vimuktes. It opens the doors to liberation. So the blessings of the devotees, very important. We sometimes, Prabhupada, however, sometimes Prabhupada would say, nobody can touch my feet. <laughs> Prabhupada was saying, like, nobody should touch his feet. Then how to get your blessings, Prabhupada? Then Prabhupada said, just bring me my slippers. <laughs> bring me my slippers, Prabhupada would say. In other words, do some service. By serving the devotees, you get the blessings of the devotees. It's not just sentimental. When they talk about take the dust and 
smear it on your body. But the mode should be to give service to the devotees. So serve Srila Prabhupada and serve Srila Prabhupada's mission. This is called society, is Prabhupada's mission. And do service for Srila Prabhupada. And that will give you the blessing. That will give us the mercy of Srila Prabhupada. That will give us the bhakti we want. You understand? Yeah. We have to we have to get bhakti from the devotees in this Krishna consciousness movement. This is the movement of devotees. So you associate with the devotees here, and certainly you'll get bhakti. You come here regularly, chant and dance and hear and ask questions, you will get bhakti, more and more bhakti every day. It will awaken the bhakti which is in us because although bhakti is in us, it's covered. It's covered over. Bhakti Vinod Thakur said, Jeev Jago, Jeev Jago. It's covered and it's dormant. We have to wake it up. And it takes that contact with the devotees to bring us to life, to bring out the bhakti which is within us. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions? Yes, please. Okay, some more questions. Any ladies have questions? No? Ladies always very quiet. Yeah? <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, today, uh, for the Kamita Ekadishi, there is a special mention of uh, Tulsi Maharani about watering Tulsi, touching the Tulsi, and uh, uh, taking the dust and uh, offering the key lamp. That we can overcome the uh, death also. So, how do we understand that? Just by doing that, uh, can we overcome death? Well, these statements are there in Shastra. We should understand that. Sometimes these things are true, but it's not that it's true in every case. Not that everybody who comes and touches Tosi or takes the dust or whatever, that they will get free of birth and death. But certainly, sometimes it's true. For certain people, it will be effective. Not that every time. So some people are worthy. They, they get that blessing. They're given that opportunity. Not everyone, but certainly you get some piety, you get some, you're doing some pious activities, you're doing some devotion, you're increasing your bhakti. So we don't know who's going to get free of birth and death, but you know, always hope for the best. I guess so much. Uh, Question is, uh, Prabhupada has mentioned many places that uh, out of the nine process of devotional service, even one, in fact, but even hearing can make us perfect. But at the same time, we see even in Gorvashtra, the deity worship is mentioned. But on other places, we see that just by hearing, uh, we can be perfect. And as like second uh, few verses before only, uh, Srinvatam Sokatha Krishna, right? That is also mentioned. Like, uh, we know this, so it's done. So the hearing alone is sufficient in itself. Then why is our uh, deity verse also emphasized? Yes. Yes. Hearing is important. Deity worship is also important. Why is deity worship emphasized? We need deity worship to keep us regulated and to keep us also pure in our habits. Without the deity worship, we'll be irregular. And we won't give so much attention to our own purity and cleanliness. So deity worship is an, an, an important aspect of devotional service. By deity worship, we know Krishna more as a person. Not just simply philosophically, but we actually know Krishna as a person because he's there in the form of the deity. So the deity worship is very important. It's not just simply hearing. Just like Arjuna asked in the Bhagavad Gita, he asked Krishna to show the Vishwarup. He said, 
you've spoken everything philosophically, but I want you to show it practically how you're in God. And so Krishna showed the Vishwaru. So similarly, we are hearing philosophically, we read the scriptures, that's good, but we want to actually see how to apply it, how to put this knowledge into practice. So that is deity worship, where we are actually applying ourselves in the practical service of Lord Krishna. Now, here, the Lord has come in the deity form. And when you go back to Godhead, the Lord will be there. And just as you're cooking for Krishna here, you can cook for Krishna there in the spiritual world. You're making garlands for Krishna here, you go back to Godhead and make garlands there for Krishna. So if we're serving the Krishna here, we serve Krishna there. But we need to hear about these things. It's very important for us to get the proper philosophical understanding to know Krishna, how he's a person, and how he's not just simply, this is not just some statue. The deities are Krishna personally. It's an incarnation of Krishna. It's an archa avatar. Krishna comes in the form of the deity. He appears at the request of its pure devotees. So in the class you have mentioned that uh, Krishna exhibits his different pastimes parallelly at different universes. So we know that Krishna can do that, but uh, whenever Krishna comes, he comes with his uh, devotees. Our devotees also can exhibit such a feelings like being omnipresent in different universes. I, I'm not getting it. No, you were mentioning that Krishna can perform his pastimes at the same time in different universes at the same time because Krishna is yeah. omnipresent. He yeah. can exhibit such an opulence. But we also know that when Krishna comes to the material world or any universe, he comes along with his devotees to exhibit those pastimes. So can the devotees who are part and parcel of Krishna can also exhibit such an opulence? Yes, and they do. Just like when Krishna married his 16,100 queens, he brought them all back to Dwarka and they had the marriage for all the queens at the same time. Krishna expanded himself 16,100 times to do the Vahayagya with each and every queen. And his mother and father also expanded themselves and came to each of the marriages. So they also, you know, all the devotees, they also can expand themselves. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada Ki. Lord Bhakti Vrinda Ki. Thank you very much, Maharaj, for the wonderful lecture and all the questions and sessions that you May we request the devotees to be seated for five minutes. Prepare the march. As you all know, Maharaj is a Teacher that he bows extensively to the parts of the world. If you'd like to support Maharaj in the preaching mission of the Prabhupada, if you'd like to contribute some Dakshina to Maharaj, you have our devotees sitting right next to the Prabhupada. You could contribute whatever you would like to do, and we will collectively hand it over to Maharaj so that he will continue his duties to the Prabhupada and the preaching mission. Thank you very much. Thank you for the announcements for the week. We have quite a few important announcements, and I would like you to pay attention. 